Jeremy Dietrich is going to uh, bring us home with uh, looking at the worlds that are near us. So, Jeremy, where do you? Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, this is going to be a little bit talk about my, my current research. I'm actually a graduate student here at the University of Arizona um, with Professor Daniel Pai. Um, and we're looking at the orbital architectures of planetary systems in general, but specifically focusing on the closest ones within 15 parsecs. So we've heard a lot this, this weekend about you know, traveling to the world, specifically using stuff like Breakthrough Starshot. But what we need to know, you know, we've always wanted to know where we belong among the stars. Um, can we find other planets out there like ours or similar to ours in some way? And can we eventually travel to these worlds ourselves? So, you know, we've started finding planets in the last 25 years or so. Um, and you can see they start getting a lot faster as we go on. And then right about now you get the Kepler uh, Space Telescope. And so we're up over uh, 4,000 confirmed exoplanets um, that we can, uh, that we've observed uh, across the universe, across the galaxy specifically. And this is a little uh, Im image of some of the closest systems to our own. Um, this is actually not fully updated. Um, there's even more we found recently that would be within these volumes. But these are just, you know, a sample of some of the closest systems that we know to date. So I took a, a bubble of 15 parsecs around the uh, solar system, and we've, we know of uh, 86 exoplanet systems. Now, there are roughly 1,500 stars or so in that bubble. So the fact we're seeing only you know, 5% or so of the systems having planets. This is a very big caveat that, that these systems are the only ones that we know of. But we, sh you know, from the statistics we have of all the other si systems, there should be planets around almost any star, basically. So there's a limit of what we can do with our current technology um, on what we can observe. So quick little table, this is, you know, um, let's go through this quickly, but um, there are 38 multi-planet systems. Um, 19 systems are these are multiple star systems and six of them actually have multiple stars and multiple planets. So from that list of, you know, 15 parsecs, which is just a little inside of 50 light years, there's a total of 108 stars in these systems with 153 confirmed planets. Um, however, there are also dozens of unconfirmed planet candidates and countless uh, missing or hidden worlds that we just haven't yet been able to discover. Uh, also, uh, many of these have hosted uh, ET civilizations in science fiction, you know, Alpha Centauri, Epsilon Eridani, Tau Ceti. Um, and for some of these, like Star Trek, Star Wars, etc., you know, they require faster than light travel for, you know, ease of storytelling. Um, hopefully we don't need that quite for some of these ones in the future. But, you know, you have the civilization video games taking you to Alpha Centauri, you have uh, the generation ship from the Nauvoo from the Expanse taking you to Tau Ceti. But there's still a lot of challenges for, you know, finding these systems that we want to travel to. You know, there's a lot of unconfirmed planet candidates. Many of these planets are likely still missing just because we just can't detect them. Either they're too small or they're not orbiting at the right angle for us to see them with our current technology. So we also have no current way to travel there easily in ships that are sized for humanity. We break through star shock and get there, but in the next 30, 50 years or so, but mi microprobes. However, what we can do is study these uh, systems, these exoplanet systems as a whole population using statistics. So what I've been working on is the dynamite integrated analysis of planetary systems. Dynamite is a uh, acronym for the dynamical multi-planet injection tester. So what we do is we take the specific incomplete data, all the data we can gather from, a, from an exoplanet system, periods, mass, radii, um, inclination, eccentricity, anything we can get from, from the system we can get, it, but it's usually incomplete. We don't have the technology yet to get everything. We can take statistical distributions and models that are gathered from large exoplanet populations like the Kepler planet population. There we have enough information there that we can actually you know, predict what the uh, likely systems would look like. So yeah, we, then we take these, these models and then apply them to the system that we have and the data we have for each system and can actually predict the presence and additional parameters for other planets in the system that we cannot currently see. Now, these, all these predictions are of testable, observable 
parameters. So any follow-up observations, we can guide them and say, hey, you know, look for these, you know, signals or something that around these periods or what the, uh, you know, radius would be and stuff. And we can actually prioritize these targets for follow-up characterizations. And so hopefully in the near near future, we'll find enticing targets for these interstellar travel. So this is a, uh, just a sh showing what this thing can do. Originally, we took uh, one Kepler system and removed a planet from it. Um, the, it's the smallest and last found planet from the system. And uh, dynamite basically finds it perfectly. It's, it says that there's expected to be a planet right there. Um, and this is just based on statistics. It has no knowledge that there is actually a planet there, but it says based on the statistics of knowing there's planets E and D, it says we should find planet F. So obviously everyone's been looking at the Alpha Centauri system. It's uh, you know, the closest one to us. It has uh, both the Alpha Centauri sun-like star and uh, Proxima nearby. So I figure we're probably going there pretty soon. That's the whole idea of breakthrough star shot. We're hoping to get there within 30 to 50 years. Um, it is a triple star system, right? So Alpha Centauri A is a sun-like star. Alpha Centauri B is slightly smaller. They orbit each other about 80 years. Proxima Centauri has a multi-thousand, multi-hundreds of thousand year orbit. Um, that orbits the main binary. Um, there actually has been evidence for planets around the main binary, around the stars in the main binary. Um, Alpha Centauri Alpha B Centauri was B thought B to host a planet, planet back in uh, 2012. However, uh, more recent analysis in 2015 uh, essentially disproved that. There is possibly a gas giant companion that uh, Alpha Centauri A that was just found this year with direct imaging. Um, the method needs additional verification. They're not quite sure that's not uh, instrumental but it's very uh, interesting because it might be near the, the habitable zone of Alpha Centauri A. However, biggest uh, the most well-known planet in the system is uh, around Proxima. So there's a likely rocky planet orbiting Proxima Centauri in its habitable zone, temperate zone. The orbital period is roughly 11 days, um, but the problem with that is it's so close that they're likely tidal locking. So the planet has one side facing the star all the time. There's also high flare activity and high UV radiation from the from Proxima. It's a very active star. And so that could have problems with uh, habitability in the future. There is an additional planet uh, orbiting at a period of about 1900 days or one and a half AU out near the ice line. Um, it is not officially confirmed, but multiple different uh, evidence for it have been found. So it is likely to be confirmed soon. And then just this year, there is another possible small planet found within the orbit of Proxima, of Proxima B at about 5.2 days. That is currently unconfirmed, but we'll still be looking for it. And so we can show, if we run Proxima Centauri through dynamite, that there is a likely possibility that D is genuine. Um, there is you know, a, high a relatively high probability that you would find a planet there, um, given where the location of planet B is. You also might find an additional planet if you're considering the likelihood of where is the next planet in the system would be out beyond B and could be in the outer edge of the habitable zone. So we have support for that unconfirmed planet candidate at 5.2 days and any additional planet would likely be at the outer edge of that habitable zone. Tau Ceti. Uh, this is the closest single sun-like star um, since Alpha Centauri A is in a triple system, uh, but it's slightly smaller and a little bit less luminous. Um, and so, you know, we would need a generational ship like the Nauvoo um, or near light speed travel, like you would see in something like Rama uh, from Arthur C. Clarke to get there. I just really love this cover of the, the Raman node outside Tau Ceti. So Tau Ceti is thought to host at least four planets. Um, there's been direct evidence confirming at least four, and there's direct but weak evidence that's not yet confirming at least up to four more planets. There's also one additional signal uh, about a period of 320 days or so that has been discarded as an alias of the Earth's orbital period itself, but that's important to, to note in the future. So this is the current status of the architecture. Um, there's basically seven planets within the inner system out to about 630 days, so just outside the habitable zone, and then there's an additional Jovian mass planet um, orbiting at about 2,000 days out near the debris disk. So if we look at the inner system, just the, the seven confirmed and unconfirmed candidates, and we look at just the confirmed candidates, we find that there's support for each of the three unconfirmed candidates in the inner system. So each of those is likely to be genuine and would dynamically pack the system, including that one 
uh, gap we talked about at 320 days or so, there is su support for that might also be a genuine signal, which if it were, would be a likely or possibly rocky planet inside the habitable zone of one of the closest stars to us. So there's an yeah, update that support for all the unconfirmed planets. Additional planet would likely fall near that 318 day signal. So here's another one. This is the GJ667. Um, I say this is relatively low because it's about five times as far as Alpha Centauri or two and a half times as far as Tau Ceti, uh, away from us, about six, six and a half parsecs. But it has three uh, small main sequence stars orbiting it. Um, there are two confirmed planets, but possibly up to seven total orbiting the smallest star. They all have a variety of sizes, and at least one of them is in that temperate habitable zone area. So this is the orbital architecture given just consuming the two confirmed planets there. You can see that there's support and evidence for uh, other additional planets. And I will cycle through adding in, we added in planet D here. If we add in planet F only, and then added in only E, only, and then F and D. And you find that the positions of planets E and F are in those small pockets of stability between the other planets and candidates. So if there was likely to be a planet there, that would be the only place you could find it if those signals were real. Um, so yeah, if all planets existed, the system would be dynamically packed all the way from the innermost planet B all the way out to G, and it would span the habitable zone. You'd have up to three planets inside the habitable zone. Unfortunately, the signals other than those for those planets B and C recently found to likely only correspond to stellar activity. Um, so there's only two confirmed planets. The other ones are um, controversial at this point. But if they were to be real, it would be a very interesting and dynamic system to, to search for. Finally, I'll, I'll talk about uh, L9859. Um, this is a system that was uh, observed with BNM dwarf. It has many in planets close to uh, the star, like Proxima Centauri. Again, about as far away as um, GJ667. But there are three known transiting planets that were found in 2019. And then two more planet or another planet, another candidate were found via radial velocity uh, just this year. And so they form a nice ordered chain all the way out to the habitable zone. And the last planet exists right where you'd expect the, last, the additional planet to be found. Um, an interesting fact about this system is that planet B is uh, only half the size of Venus. And so we have a large variety of planet sizes and, and uh, masses that we could test here and in a system we could really learn a lot from uh, as well. And then, so if we include planet F, it pushes another planet out directly into the center of the habitable zone. So looking forward, as we know, 86 exoplanet systems within 15 parsecs. That we know of. There should be 90, you know, we're missing 95% probably of the exoplanet systems. 153 confirmed planets, but uh, there are dozens or even hundreds that are unconfirmed or controversial. Um, and there are a significant number in that habitable zone. Um, these are potentially habitable worlds based on a whole bunch of other factors that would need to be discussed. And since we're in development for the technology to send probes to these nearby systems, you know, we can use dynamite to basically look for and, and characterize the best targets to send probes and eventually send humanity all the way there. So I'll end there. So how many data points within a system are necessary to predict the full system? Could you, for example, predict a five planet system from only two known planets or do you need more data? Right, so currently we uh, require two planets. Uh, otherwise everything is kind of extra uh, extrapolatory. Um, we're only would be um, accurate with two planets, but starting from two planets, you can run dynamite iteratively and it finds the next most likely planet. So for example, with Tau Ceti, we had four and each one of those we added, we could add up to seven. So yeah, you can start with two planets and um, eventually if you wanted to, to run it in, uh, iteratively or to, to test certain hypotheses, you could find four or five planets and work your way up. Does dynamite take into account um, planet mass? I didn't see any specific reference to that in the way that the algorithm works. And so I was wondering if um, you have, you know, Jupiter-like Jovian planets that intermix as well with um, smaller rocky worlds that would change the statistical distributions. 
Yes. So the mass comes in in the graph by uh, dynamical stability. So we ensure that um, systems are dynamically stable if we were to insert a planet. And so um, basically, if they come too close, there's a little, uh, it runs a simulation to try to see whether or not the planet will get ejected. Um, currently, the uh, population statistics are only accurate out to about Neptune mass planets. So we're only uh, dealing with statistics of those. But uh, yeah, Jupiter mass planets would definitely, if you had Jupiter mass planets near Earth mass planets, it would definitely become a bit more it would be harder to inject planets there because oh, of the okay. mass. So is that how you get the different heights on those relative likelihoods where you've got the really low um, low height relative likelihoods near the one day period and the relatively higher at the 100 day? Right. So the dynamical stability says one, near one day, it's, it's yeah, there's, there's a, the problem with planet B's right there. Also, you're so close to the star that the star itself, the mass of the star itself will also be having problems. And then there's that little bump, it's hard to see, uh, between planet C and D. Mm -hmm. And that's because the masses of C and D are more than the mass of planet B and E. And so those are the hardest places to find one. If you switched, for example, the orbits of planet C and B, you might find more uh, probability there at that smaller gap, just because planet B is a smaller mass and therefore would have more room to put another planet. Oh, okay. And so that's what leads to the dynamic packing that you were- Yes. Okay, gotcha. Are you using any machine learning or neural networks as part of your predictive tool? Um, currently, there is an option to utilize the Spock um, dynamical stability package, which uh, runs machine learning on a small um, like integration of the, peer, of the system to determine the stability. Um, that is a, uh, one of the options we have. Um, we allow for multiple different types of, of options for dynamical stability. Uh, the, the period distributions, the radius distributions, and stuff like that. Um, but so right now, it's not guaranteed that machine learning is part of it. But if you wanted to run it with the machine learning aspect from Spock to determine the stability, then you then that's uh, able to be done. So, are you able to comment on all at all on like how much computing power this actually takes? So, if you use the uh, the simple dynamic stability model we have, um, this thing takes 15 seconds for any given system. Uh, to run 100,000 iterations of the system and, and produce this sort of graph here. If you wanted to run something where you were using an in-body integration uh, for every single one of those iterations, then, you know, I use a supercomputer cluster with hundreds of cores and it would take a day. Um, so anywhere in between those two, depending on where you want to set up your, um, like, like what, where you want to use the in-body integrations, that's the level of uh, computing power needed. Okay. All right, Jeremy, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.